Welcome to the one and only session at Virtual Summit 2020 that is formed by 46 characters, getting you up to speed on the Intersystems API Manager. Presented by me, Stefan Wittmann, a product manager looking after interoperability. I've been with Intersystems now for over 14 years in various roles and I'm based in Germany. So if I speak funny, let me know. We're going to cover two big topics today. Uh, first of all, a quick introduction to what API management in general means and how this is reflected in the Intersystems API Manager. And as a secondary topic, we're going to take a look at the latest release of IAM version 1.5. So without further ado, let's take a look at what API management really means. Most people start thinking about monitoring and controlling the APIs that they offer. They want to be able to understand which APIs are in use, how often are they being called, are they abandoned, and they want to be able to control by protecting their APIs who is allowed um, to issue requests against a certain endpoint. Maintenance usually comes to mind as well. You want to be able to take down an endpoint uh, for maintenance or you want to be able to introduce a second or a third version of an endpoint um, as you enhance your APIs. As soon as you grow, onboarding starts to become a huge problem. You want to be able to educate other developers, very often third-party developers, to understand what APIs are available to them and how they're supposed to use them. A developer portal is a centralized place that allows developers to self-sign up and then understand which APIs they can use. Um, they usually include interactive endpoints so they can start to play around and see what kind of responses come back as they change the parameters in their calls. Um, this overall allows your development te team for your APIs to focus on innovating and building and enhancing the APIs instead of teaching and educating other developers how to use what you have. Um, as a third topic, obviously, you want this to be transparent uh, for your infrastructure. So you want to be make sure that an API management tool like IAM scales horizontally as well as vertically to meet the demand. You also want to make sure um, that it allows you to, uh, to, uh, to use secure practices across your endpoints and make sure that you have one central place uh, for managing and securing your APIs. Overall, the architecture is, is really trivial. Um, users, we call them consumers here, are sending HTTP-based traffic to IAM. And an element which we call a route here then takes this traffic and figures out to which upstream service um, this request should be routed to. Um, a service is something like uh, an IRIS instance or a Kafka system. Um, which offers some kind of functionality and capability that you are, you are evading a response from. Um, if you have multiple servers um, that offer the same functionality for redundancy or for uh, handling larger amounts of load, um, you can group them in an upstream, allowing you to automatically load balance them in IAM, which is a very powerful feature. One of the first things that you're probably going to do is introducing multiple versions of your APIs and let's say if we are being attacked by an evil robot uh, like a Dalek, um, then we could choose by how the way how we configure that request to which doctor we want to route this message to. Um, it could be just by using the version uh, number in the in the UI path. It could also be by uh, selecting the version as a header, depending on how your server is set up to to accept um, the version number. Um, just by using multiple routes for these different kinds of endpoints gives you out of the box analytical support for an understanding which versions of your API are in use, which endpoints are popular, which endpoints are abandoned and you should start deprecating them or maybe even removing them if, if nobody is using them anymore. And it gives you an idea of which APIs um, have a higher error rate or not. Um, and that's very valuable insight you gain out of the box without any additional effort. Any added behavior above the basic routing is being handled by a plugin infrastructure. Every added behavior comes from a plugin that you add to the system. 
either globally, which means that every API traffic that goes through IAM is being affected by this plugin, or it's uh, a scope plugin that is tied to one of the players that we've seen in the architecture screen, a consumer, a route, or a service. One of the things we're going to take a look at in the demo too is the rate limiting plugin, which allows you to limit how many requests are being sent through the system uh, in a certain amount of time. So that's everything you need to know for the basics. Let's take a look at what IAM 1.5 has to offer. Um, there are three major areas that we're interested in here. Um, Kafka support is one of the big topics. So now you can basically take your HTTP based traffic that goes into IAM and route it to a Kafka service. This allows for very interesting analytical use cases where you can start to identify what kind of traffic patterns are happening inside your IAM instance. The user experience has been improved by a lot. Um, everything that used to be copying of IDs around are now really drop down windows so that you can select um, how you want to link a route to a service and so on. The developer portal uh, got also huge improvements. Many of the things that you had to do on a file level before are now directly manageable and configurable directly inside the portal. Setting up your API manager has, been, has never been easier. So let's take a look at how this looks like for real. So we're now looking at an instance of IAM on the latest version 1.5. Um, I've set up a Gummy Bear factory workspace here. Uh, about 2,300 requests are coming in in the last five minutes. Um, sent by three different consumers to one total service, which in my case is an Iris instance that I've set up. About 58% of all the requests that are coming in are actually erroring out. Um, so we definitely want to take a look at what's going on here. If I dive into the service, um, I can see on which IP address this service is currently located. I can see all the routes that are associated with this service. Um, so version one and two of our gummy bear factory and a special service for ordering gummy bears. Uh, I have currently no plugins configured for this backend. Um, and I can take a look at the status codes that this um, system is um, returning. Um, and the majority here uh, on the bad ones we can see are four or fours, which means that um, somebody is hitting an endpoint that's not actually there. We can always um, dive into a route and take a look at, say, at version one. Um, we see traffic is pretty light here, only about 300 requests in the last five minutes, and it's healthy, um, so all good status codes. Uh, if you're taking a look at version two, uh, we can see much more traffic happening here, about 2,000, and definitely a couple of 404s in here. Um, if we dive into consumers, we can also um, aggregate the data according to consumers. So if we take a look at Jelly Belly, we can see that all of his requests are coming back as a 404. So he's definitely hitting an endpoint that's not there. Um, if we um, click on the status code 404, we can see um, how this um, spans across multiple paths. In this case, we see that everything is happening on V2 and not on V1. Um, so we know exactly what we can do uh, to mitigate the fact here. So one of the things you might want to do is for the time being, um, limit the amount of requests that Jelly Belly can send to uh, a service um, because he's he's going to endpoints that are not there anyway, right? Um, so we can take a little bit of that load from our server. So the way how we can do this here is just click on plugins and add a plugin, which will automatically if we select the rate limiting plugin, which will automatically be scoped to this consumer Jelly Belly. Um, what we're going to do here is uh, set the uh, minute field to five, which basically says that only five requests are allowed per minute. Um, and that's about it. So what's now going to happen is that um, as soon as Jelly Belly hits his quota of five messages per minute, um, we will start sending back 429s instead of 404s um, to Jelly Belly, indicating that he hit his quota. 
Um, this response will also include header information, how many requests he can make per minute, um, and how many he has already used up. Um, so this is a nice way of taking in unnecessary load off from our Iris instance, um, because these 429s, um, the requests are never actually passed through to the Iris system. Um, that's a really nice way of ensuring that our server can handle all the load um, as we scale up. Uh, while we look at this graph, we can see that the uh, ratio of 4 to 9s um, to 4 to 4s is now increasing um, um, because we only allow five messages to get through per minute. Um, also, um, the next thing we can take a look at here is um, when you create a new route, um, you usually tie it to a server, uh, to a service. Um, this used to be an ID field that you had to copy in. Um, now this is a drop-down box, um, so the the user experience here has improved quite a lot. Taking a look at the plugins, um, currently we have two plugins on the system, basic authentication, uh, which is applied globally, and rate limiting, which is the plugin we just configured, and it's just tied to the consumer jelly belly. While we're here on the plugin screen, I want to show you um, the Kafka plugin. I've uh, set up a Kafka um, server here on this instance, and uh, we can start a consumer listening in on port 1992 on the topic IAM log. Right now it's quiet, nothing's happening. That's because we haven't set it up yet. Um, I just want to show you that nothing else is feeding in. When we go back to IAM, we can now create a new plugin down here in the logging section called Kafka. And um, we're only making a couple of adjustments here. Uh, not being asynchronous, we're adding a bootstrap server, my IP and my port, and we're configuring the topic name IAM log. As soon as I hit create, this plugin automatically gets activated, uh, it's enabled, and now we can see all the messages being proxied to the Kafka server as well, and we can see them here in this consumer. Um, this is highly configurable, so you can send just the headers or just the body or header and body, or you can start to only send certain header fields like the username um, to the Kafka upstream. And that allows you to um, start some analytical queries and figure out what's going on in the IAM, in IAM system and if uh, there are any patterns that are emerging. Um, so very interesting. Let's get rid of this plugin. Um, for now and switch over to the developer portal. I've already enabled the developer portal here on this workspace. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, it's interactive, it's with self sign up. Um, so I can create a developer account, log in or create one. And I can um, uh, browse the, the catalog for all the APIs that are available to me and interactively uh, try them out and see what kind of responses are coming back to me. Um, but I don't want to spend too much time on the portal by itself. I want to show you that all the settings are now part of the portal directly, so you can configure it without jumping back on the file level. Um, you can change the appearance of the portal directly here by uploading an image or by changing the colors of the various aspects of the portal to accommodate um, your corporate identity and make this portal look like something that your company built. You can manage your developers, approve them, reject them, or revoke their access. You can handle the file permission, um, so to make sure that developers only have access to what they're supposed to actually see. And last but not least, we have a very powerful editor allowing you to take a look at all the various pages that are part of the developer portal and change them in, an, in a very interactive way. So let's say this port was built with ice cream. If I click on save, it directly gets reflected here in the preview, but also if I reload the, uh, the developer portal, it also automatically picks up these changes. It didn't. Now it did, it didn't reload properly. How hard can it be to hit a button? <laughs> so this is a very pow powerful feature it doesn't allow you just to uh, uh, change text files or the configuration uh, elements. It also allows you to 
um, work with all the partials, like let's say the, uh, the footer, um, which you can find uh, below here in your portal. You can change the portal name, you can change the links to your terms of service page or the privacy page, which currently are not linked, um, to, to really make the portal something that you own and configure it um, to your best use. Um, I think the editor is, is very powerful and, and allows you to quickly customize the portal um, to, uh, to the way you would like it to look like. Um, this is everything I have for the demo for today. Um, so let's jump right back into the slides. So now that we've seen IAM in action, let's take a look at the key takeaways. First of all, you want to make sure that you can govern and monitor your APIs. That's the most important topic for most people that are interested in API management. Make sure you have one central place to uh, establish your security policies and the different security authentication mechanisms that you have to establish. Um, whether this be OAuth2, uh, basic authentication, key authentication tokens, they're all supported by IAM. And it's important that you have one central place for setting this up. The next big topic usually is onboarding. You wanna make sure that uh, developers, whether they are internal developers uh, in-house from different departments, um, whether they are developers uh, from third-party companies, you want to make sure that they can quickly learn and understand what APIs are available to them and how they're supposed to use them. This will free up your development team to really work and innovate on the APIs instead of explaining other developers how they're supposed to use what you already have. Then obviously, Take a look at the latest release of IAM 1.5 um, with the three big topics um, that are the additions of the Kafka logging support, which allows you to uh, stream your requests directly to a Kafka system, um, which makes up some really interesting analytical use cases, um, or also for feeding in um, one of your data lakes, uh, if it makes sense. Uh, customizing your developer portal has never been easier with 1.5. Everything that used to be file-based uh, operations and configurations on the developer portal are now part of the, um, the IAM portal and allows you to easily configure it and match your corporate identity style. Um, this will allow you um, to present a developer portal to your users that doesn't just look like something that came somewhere out of the box but it's something that your company built and is offering them for their benefit. Last but not least, um, various UX improvements that make your life so much easier um, to take control of your APIs. The next steps, uh, if you want to learn more, um, obviously there are more sessions at this virtual summit um, this year um, that cover um, IAM as a topic. Um, First of all, the next session that I'm going to call out here, tell the world about your REST APIs, the benefits of a centralized developer portal. I think that's the only session that has more characters in the title than this session. <laughs> this session obviously um, is, is centered around the developer portal and how you can set it up um, to make the most use out of it. This, the other session, best practices for InterSystems API Manager, um, is centering a, around the questions how you should set up IAM to benef benefit from it in the best way. How should you set up your routes? How should you set up your services? How should you approach workspaces? And what should an, an, the overall architecture and infrastructure of IAM nodes look like um, for high availability and disaster recovery scenarios? Never forget about our learning portal. Uh, you can find this under learning.intersystems.com. And as always, we're looking forward to your feedback and comments. So um, please feel free to connect with us and stay in touch. Um, you can find my details on the slide here. You can find me on, on Twitter and LinkedIn, um, whatever suits your needs. And with this, um, I would like to thank you uh, for your interest. And I hope you stay safe and healthy. Bye.